Hey everyone. Um, good morning, good evening, whenever you hear this message. Um, we're going to do chapter 7, the antidote for fear in our Do It Afraid study guide. And this was a very impactful chapter for me. The story that goes along with it, if you've not read it yet, is about a lady named Donna who from the time she was a little girl was scared of the dark and she did not conquer her fear until she was married, had children, and she finally came to the realization that God is always with us and she found her strength to overcome her fear through memorizing and reciting scripture when she was afraid. And that is something that we all can learn to do. And I've done that in my life. And when I'm going through a certain situation, I will go to scripture and read up about it. Um, more times than not, I'll just open up something, whether it's social media or just uh, a book I'm reading or whatever I'm doing, and there will be a scripture. So it's everywhere, and God puts those God winks in there to strengthen us and get us through our fearful or anxious times. The um, quote that starts the um, study in chapter seven comes from T.D. Jakes, and he's one of my favorite uh, ministers out there. His books, his everything is just great, and he's spot on. And it says, Resist your fear. Fear will lead you, will never lead you, will never lead you to a positive end. Go for your faith and what you believe. God will lead you to a positive end, but fear will not. And the first question in chapter seven is, what are some effective ways you are learning to resist fear through this study? And I have to remind myself this all the time, anxiety and fear and negativity and all of the and attacks, they all come from Satan. He can use weather, he can, he can use people, things, um, emotions, everything against us. But only good things come from God. So go immediately to God when you feel these things bubbling up. The next question is, fear never leads to a positive outcome, but faith always does. How have you experienced fear leading you in a negative direction and faith leading you to a positive end? Years ago... I didn't know how to say no to people when they would ask me to do something, go somewhere, be on a board of directors, uh, go to an event. I wore myself so thin that, I mean, I was just absolutely exhausted and I no longer found any joy in anything I was doing because I was just so burnt out and tired. If you don't learn to set boundaries and say no, even if it's a family member or work or church or your civic organization, you will burn out and you will be angry and resentful. And um, that's when the devil really gets in there and attacks you. So I have learned how to say no because I didn't want to disappoint anyone or I didn't want to be left out or I didn't want to be disliked or whatever the case may be. And a lot of times the Lord would give me that gut feeling, you don't need to go to this. You don't need to do this. And I did it anyway. And then shortly after either being there or going there, I knew I didn't need to be there for various reasons. And sometimes... God puts up roadblocks for our protection. And this happened probably about 15 years ago now, uh, you know, 10 to 15 years ago. 
And uh, a friend of mine and some of his friends were going down to do uh, broadcasting for the Senior Bowl in Mobile. And I was so excited because I was going to get to go and help. And everybody knows how much I love sports. And so I was really, really, really excited about this. And I'd taken off work. I already had my, basically I was packed and ready to go. My friend, his uncle passed away. So he couldn't go. And I was so upset. I was like, well, can I just drive down there and be a part of it? And he said, well, you know, it, it, it was all depending on him being there. He was my connection, yada, yada. Long story short, I didn't go and I was very disappointed. And at that time, I did not handle disappointment well at all. Now I would just say, oh, well, just wasn't meant to be. That instant taught me a lot because his other two friends that went were in a near fatal car accident. And it was explained to me that how we would have been riding it in this SUV that night, one or both of us would have been killed but because of the impact. I learned right then and there God puts up roadblocks for protecting us from ourselves. And I didn't know that was going to happen. And I didn't even know it happened when it did. I found out a, about a week later. And um, I learned so much in that disappointment that God was really protecting me. And I cried and I thanked God. And I still thank him every day for the protection. And there's times when I'm running late in the morning or um, I get delayed in traffic or, you know, some, some crazy something happens and I get a delay. Or I'm in a long line somewhere and, you know, I'm fussy about it. I have to stop and remind myself that God is protecting us in the waiting, even if it's something as minute as standing in line in a store. I don't know what could happen when I walk out the door in the parking lot or on the road back to home or work. I've had to stop and really talk to myself and say, you know what, I might be a minute or two late, but it's better to get there alive than dead. So, I've learned that um, we can have fear of missing out, but sometimes our, our missing out on something is really our protection. And that's just God protecting his children. And um, the next section or the next question said, Like Donna, who was scared of the dark, have you ever struggled with a fear that tormented you for as long as you can remember, one you never outgrew, how can a closer relationship with God help you confront that fear? A few years ago, it was during COVID, I would say it's the spring of 2020, we had devastating tornadoes come through. I have had a fear and anxiety of storms my whole life and it was on um we had we had some during palm sunday weekend and then easter weekend and this happened on easter night and the weekend before i did not sleep all night i made myself sick being scared and worried about those storms and the lord had to talk to me and say what is it exactly that you're so afraid of in the storms? Is it losing your home and everything in it? Is it losing your life or losing? What is it about it? Well, I just, it's all the above, but he said, if I were to take your home and everything in it, would you still praise my name? And I had to, no question, Lord, yes, 
Because it's all a gift from you. It's all yours. That's just you taking it. And, and there would be something good come of it, even in the destruction of it. Then he said, if I took Lucy from you, would you still praise my name? And the pause came. It was not as quick an answer. But I had to remind myself again, Lucy is a gift from God. I love her so much. But she is from him and I cannot love anything more than God. Certainly not material things and not people and not my little Lucy. So that night I said, yes, Lord, I would still praise your name in my weeping. And he said, then put Lucy in her baby bed. Get in your bed, take three breaths. And I never made it to the third one until I was asleep. I still get anxiety, but I know that God is in control. I can't do anything about my about a storm except just be somewhere where I'm as safe as I can be. But whatever's going to happen in that storm is going to happen. Don't be reckless and be in a car or being outside or whatever, but I've had to learn, go and do what you can to be safe and put the rest of it in the Lord's hands. Will I ever like storms? No. Will I ever like snakes? No. I want them all to be eradicated from the earth. There, People said, you know, oh, well, that's a good snake. No, the only good snake is a dead snake. And um, so, you know, you just have to face those fears. And even though I don't like storms and I don't like snakes, they're a part of life and you have to Face them and move forward. Next it asks, Donna discovered that God had not left her alone to face her fears and re realized that he was with her to help her conquer them. In what situations do you need to trust God is always with you and ask him to protect um, every fear you face? Well, as I said, storms and snakes and when i have to go and be around my mother or deal with something with her i have to put on the full armor of christ going into that situation because she is always bringing daggers towards me those are things i have had to develop less of a fear and i have to do it afraid even when i am afraid there are things that we just simply cannot avoid life in life and move forward. Some people avoid them, like my mother, and they have a stagnant life. I don't want that life. So I am going to face my fears afraid. Because the Lord is with me and he's in me and he's for me. So there you go. The Lord led Donna to memorize scriptures, which we talked about a minute ago about her fear, which helped her to defeat it. What scripture will you choose to memorize to help you overcome and defeat your fears by and help you to do it afraid? Well, Jeremiah 21, 11 is my favorite. For I know the plans and thoughts that I have for you, says the Lord, plans for good, peace, not destruction, to give you a future uh, and of hope. It's all over my house. It's, it's written down everywhere. I need that reminder that he is for me. He doesn't want bad things to happen. And even when they do, he is still with us. The fear fighting truths. These are key truths from chapter 7. Check the ones that you most need to believe and apply to your life. The first one. One reason you can live without fear is that God loves you. With a perfect love. You can be confident in his love at all time, in every situation, in every circumstance. The second one, insecurity and feelings of inadequacy are forms of fear. And that is a lot of people come across as either um, self-centered or cocky or uh, mean or hateful 
a lot of times, like my mother, they're so afraid people are going to find out that they're so insecure and they self-hate so bad that they put up these, these personas and they're very little people on the inside. And so insecurities and feelings of inadequacy are forms of fear. The way to break free from them is to believe in your heart that God loves you and to receive and live with confidence in his love. I've had to learn to do that because I certainly wasn't taught that. And I hope this book teaches you that. That is a very, very important life lesson. The next one, God's love is being poured out on you at all times. And we just have to receive it. He's pouring it out on us. But the problem is too many times we don't receive it. We don't think we deserve it. And so we miss so many blessings. We block our own blessings. It's a gift which you can never earn or deserve. You receive it by faith, knowing that God loves you so much that he sent his only son to die for our sins and reconcile our sin um, on the cross. The next one, bouncing between a feeling of proud of yourself when you think you have done well and feeling guilty when you think you haven't will waste your time and energy. Your performance does not change God's love for you. He does not love you any less or any more than he did the day that he created you. And those are powerful words. He loves us so much. He sent his only son to die brutally on the cross for us. Your relationship with yourself is of vital importance. Do whatever you need to do to make sure your relationship with yourself is strong and healthy and to love yourself in a godly way. Don't make yourself your God. Don't think more of yourself than other people. You're no better or less than another person just because they make you feel that way. Knowing who I am now in God makes me be able to face my mother and put her in her place because I know who I am in Christ. She can say all the awful lies and slanderous things about me, but I go in there going, I know who I am in Christ. Does it hurt what she says? Yes. Do I know who I am in Christ? Yes. And he will vindicate us. And we, we don't always have to fight with these people that make us feel less than or that criticize us or puts us down. He will be our vindicator. The next one is fear and insecurity will not willingly let you go. Choose to be aggressive against them. So that you can be free to become all God wants you to be and enjoy the life that he wants you to live. People and fears and insecurities, past failures, past relationships, whatever it is, whatever that insecurity you have, it's never going to stop until you stop it. And we alone can't do that. We have to cry out for the Lord to help us to do that. In the taking courage and word section, um, the first scripture comes from 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love. Dread does not exist in love, but perfect, complete, full grown love drives out fear because fear involves the expectation of punishment so the one who is afraid of god's punishment is not perfected in his love and has not grown into a significant understanding of god's love what i preach on a lot and what joyce preaches on and others the spiritual maturity when you mature spiritually you no longer 
tolerate um, things that you once did. You love yourself with a God-like love and not a self-centered love, but you also don't set yourself up for failure. You love in a divine way because God loves you and he wants you to love yourself enough to not tolerate those things. And this says, according to 1 John 4, 18, what is the antidote for fear? It is love, God's perfect love. And then the next one comes from Romans 35, 37, and 30, through 39. And let's see. Verse 35, who shall ever separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, distress, and persecution, famine, nakedness, or danger, or a sword? Verse 37, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors and gain an overwhelming victory through him who loved us so much that he died for us. For I am convinced and continue to be convinced beyond any doubt that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present and threatening or things to come, no power, no height, no depth, nor any other created things will be able to separate us from the unlimited love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And this says, read Romans 7, 8, 35, 37 through 39. What can you learn from these passages about how does it, and how does it encourage you? Well, nothing on earth or anywhere else can separate us from the love of God once we become Christians. We are more than conquerors and we are victors because Christ died for us. So that is our right when we become the new creation in Christ. When we become reborn again, as people call it, just when you're saved by the blood of Christ, you are new and your old self dies away and you are made new. Nothing at that point can separate you from God. And that to me is such a, comforting thing in Romans 5 5 such hope in God's promises never disappoint us because God's love has been abundantly poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given to us and it says based on Romans 5 5 where can you find the love of God in his promises within our hearts when we accept as Christians for Christ to become our Savior. And he lives with us until the end and then we get to go be with our Father. Romans 5, 6 through 8. While we were still helpless, powerless to provide for our salvation, at the right time, Christ died as a substitute for the ungodly. Now it is extraordinarily thing, it is an extraordinarily thing for one to willingly give his own life even for an upright man, though per, perhaps for a good man, one who is noble and selfless and worthy. Someone might even dare to die. But God clearly shows and Im improves his own love for us by the fact that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then it also in this part of the study guide, it wants us to read Ephesians 2, 4 through 5. But God being so very rich in mercy because of his great wonderful love, which he loves us, even when we were spiritually dead and separate from him, 
because of our sins, he made us spiritually alive together with Christ. For by his grace and his un unreserved favor and mercy, you have been saved from God's judgment. This says, after reading those passages, what did they teach you about Christ's love and the fact that people can never deserve it? We can't earn it. We can't do anything except accept Christ as Savior to reconcile us back to God. That is the only way. And it says that many times in the Bible. So we, are, we have no power and no authority without being Christians. And um, he is our power source. So he knew we needed a savior. He sent Christ. And so through Jesus, the cross, the death equals our eternity. If we choose. It is not a given. We have to choose to love and accept Christ as our Savior. And if you haven't, don't wait. Time is really running out. And the next scripture text comes from Psalms 40, verse 2. He brought me up out of a horrible pit. Of destruction out of the murky clay when I had my nervous breakdown I was in that murky clay and I could feel the weight of cold bitterly cold burning cold water no light chained down couldn't breathe it was a horrible time but in in just a moment of crying out to the Lord to make me better or bring me home he said take my hand this will not happen overnight you will not get better overnight you will not overcome this depression that you're in overnight but with my help and taking my hand said the Lord I will get you out of this murky pit that you're in and so, uh, it said, what does God do for those who feel like they're in a pit of destruction? Well, I just told you. He gets us out of it. His plan is better. And yes, I probably set myself back. But by being obedient, I, he's just blessing and healing. And where I feel like back on schedule for his plan for my life. In um, Luke 22, 54 through 62. Now bear with me. I know it's a lot. Then they seized him and led him away and brought him to the house of the Jewish high priest. And Peter was following at a safe distance after they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat among them. And a servant girl seeing him sitting at the firelight looked at him and said, this man was with him too. This is when he denies Christ or denies Jesus three times. But Peter denied it saying, woman, I do not know him. A little later, um, Someone else saw him and said, you're the one, you're one of them too. But Peter said, man, I am not. About a half an hour had passed and another man began to insist this man was with him for he is a Galilean too. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. Immediately while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord and how he had told him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly, deeply grieved and distressed. And now the men who were holding Jesus in custody 
were mocking and ridiculing him and treating him with contempt and beating him. And um, they also, during this passage, wanted us to read Acts 2.41. In verse 41, it says, So then, those who accept his message were baptized, and on that day, 3,000 souls were added to the body of believers. God knew that Peter was going to deny him. But when he weeped and he knew what he'd done was wrong and when he repented, it was a great act. God knows all the wrongdoings we're going to do in our life. He wants us to be obedient and repentant. He forgives quickly and forgets our sins as far as the east is to the west. Nothing you have ever done in your life could ever cause him to hate you or cast you into hell except not making it where you reconcile your bill, becoming a Christian, giving your heart to Christ. He will deny you and he will say he's never known you because he didn't. Because you, if you don't become a Christian and confess and repent of your sins, that you know Christ is your Savior, you will spend eternity in hell. There is just heaven and hell. And where I was mentally... When I had my nervous breakdown at 29 years old, that is not a place that anyone wants to be. Trust me. Give your heart to the Lord. Repent. Change your ways. I'm begging you. In these passages that I have read from Luke 22, 54 through 62 and Acts 2, 41, how did Peter behave? And in Luke 22, well, he wept uncontrollably. And after the Holy Spirit touched him, how did Peter's ministry after that affect people in Acts 2? Well, 3,000 souls was saved and baptized and became members of um, Heaven's Court. And then it says, do you believe God can work a similar transformation in you? Well, yes, I've lived it. I see it every day. And then our last scripture text comes from Ephesians 6.10. In conclusion, be strong in the Lord, draw your strength from him, and be empowered through your union with him and in the power of his boundless might. I love that. And it says to fill in the blanks from Ephesians 6.10, which encourages you to be, and the word is empowered, in the Lord and in the blank, through your union with him with his limitless might. He can do all things. He can see all things. His power is, he has no limits. We have limits and we need him to help us get through it. In the moving forward and freedom section, what is the cure for the insecure? And that is just re receiving and believing the love of God. Do you have a healthy relationship with yourself? If not, how can you receive God's love and begin to love yourself in a balanced way as God loves you? Why is this important? Well, I do now, and I've explained that earlier, and that's something that you have to walk out. And um, he heals us so that we can be his love and light into the world. And so that we... Um, we can help bring other people to him. 
So when we love ourselves and we walk in the love and light of Christ, and we fully believe and surrender to him, we can draw people to him and build the kingdom, which is what we're sent here to do anyway. God made you unique and special, and he loves you just as you are. What are some of your unique characteristics or ability, and what are your best qualities? Well, I personally believe in the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If they don't, forgive them and pray for them. Uh, some of my best qualities is, um, you know, I... I I'm, I love to make people laugh. I love to make people feel loved. Um, I love sharing the word of God. Um, you know, I, as you can see, I'm very colorful and very sparkly. You're never going to see me in all black. If you do, something's bad wrong. Put me, get me some help. Um, I really don't own anything that's, it's all black. Um, if I have on black, it's usually hound's tooth or animal print because I just don't, I, I'm just never going to be known as somebody that's basic. <laughs> that's just not me. So that's, that's some of the things that make me special. I love to cook. I love to cook for other people. It brings me such joy. I love to give gifts. I also love to receive gifts. So I just love making other people happy. And, um, then it says, when we love God, we want to obey him. How can you be obedient to God this week as a way of demonstrating your love for him? Well, one thing is, is starting your day with um, Thanksgiving, giving thanks to God right out the gate and ending your day that way. Uh, how you carry yourself and things you say and your actions around other people. It needs to be positive as a positive Christ representative. And we need to slow down so that we can hear what God is telling us. Why is it extremely difficult to be set free from something if we refuse to admit it? That is... It is a problem or if we use it as a means to control people. Well, when you use it as a means to control people or you don't see yourself as the problem, you're using that as a crutch. And if you say you're a Christian, you're being a hypocrite when you do these things. We cannot change until we face what is wrong with us and how we treat others and how we walk through our lives. Just like with me, I used to lose my temper and get disappointed very easily and throw temper tantrums. Or if a ball game turned out a way I didn't like it, I would get upset about that. Those things have to, when you're becoming spiritually mature, you have to act different and you have to let those things go and move on differently. Fill in the blanks. The third paragraph of sec the section, Secure in Christ, says that God is an expert at blank, healing the brokenhearted and making us free and victorious. What practical steps can you take to be aggressive against fear and insecurity so you will become everything God wants you to be? When you start becoming secure in yourself and loving yourself and, and spiritually mature, you carry yourself different and you act different when you're out in the world. And you go immediately to God with your issues. And when someone hurts you, you pray and you forgive. You stand on the promises and the word of God. So those are your practical steps. In the keep this in mind section, remember, remember, remember this. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. 
The one who fears is not made perfect in love. 1 John 4.18 God's love is not given in varying degrees based upon our level of so-called perfection. But God is love. He loves us because he is kind and he wants to um, love us no matter what you do. If you don't stop, it, it won't stop God from loving you. It may stop you from receiving his love, but his love is always present to heal and to deliver no matter what. Accept Christ's love. Don't get that fear and anxiety and that feeling of, I am not good enough. Accept his love. Rise up and share his love. And I appreciate your time. And we will work on chapter 8. And until we meet again, I hope each and every one of you enjoyed chapter 7 and got a lot out of it like I did. Till we meet again, God bless you all.